Yeah, that sounds good to me. Sorry, my glasses are broken, so we're just gonna be dealing with that today. Actually, should Didn't I you just get new glasses? They are in being made. <laughs> I ordered them a week oh. ago, two weeks ago, and they should be here like March 1st or something. Off. It's fine. I don't need to see. Welcome to another turning. I'm Jesse, and my brother Ben and I are on a quest to inform everyone about the upcoming Amazon adaptation of Wheel of Time. Our hopes, our fears, and our grand opinion. Follow along as we revisit some of the history of the series' path to the screen and predict what is yet to come. Hello, this is a bonus episode for another turning. I'm Ben. And I'm Jesse. So. We're going to take a bit of a small break from Wheel of Time news, and today we're going to be talking about our thoughts on The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. So first off, I have read and listened to all of the Stormlight Archive already, but I did do a re-listen specifically since, Jesse, you just finished reading Way of Kings for the first time, correct? Yeah, so I've been kind of putting off Stormlight Archive for a while because I don't like reading unfinished series. So I was kind of planning on waiting until at least arc one was done, you know, the first five books. But um, I don't know, the FOMO finally got to me and I felt like I finally had to get started. So a friend offered to read it with me. So we decided to read it and I just finished yesterday. Yeah. Um. So the beginning of this, uh, I wanted to keep it spoiler free just because, you know, I don't know, you do more of your reactions to books than I do, but this is a big series. And I think, you know, if we see if people are interested in it, they can at least watch the beginning of this um, or listen to it. And yeah, starting with the bit spoiled. Yeah, starting with spoiler free or a spoiler free review is a good idea. So I don't know, you've read much further than me in the series as a whole, but what what are your thoughts for just Wave Kings? What's your opinion? I'm doing a doing a re-listen to it. Uh really helped refresh my memory because it's the first book I like it. there's a lot of things about it I like it and I, I actually took some notes I know it's weird I tried oh. to um but there was a couple of things I really liked and um since you've read some of Robin Hobb one thing I found I like in books a lot is those little intro things before each oh the epic yeah the epigraphs I see with Sanderson specifically I pay attention to the epigraphs because in Mistborn he I don't want to spoil yeah. anything, but Sanderson likes to hide a lot of information in his epigraphs. So I was well, paying we'll attention see. this time. Yeah. Well, see, like I said, I compared it to Robin Hobb because it expands the world without... Now, in Way of Kings, it's a little bit more confusing. And I said, it's I like it, but it can also be kind of confusing because it's like, what is this talking about? And we can talk about it more later. Um, uh-huh after we get into more spoiler territory but i really enjoy that it's an enjoyable writing style along with anything that builds the world outside of the um actual story like i like i'm a sucker for the prologue where it's like seems what is happening constant. yeah i love it um personally it, it's great for me some people i could see there is a lot of like you're throwing a lot of information that doesn't pertain to the main story right now mm -hmm. And I could see how that could turn some people off to a book, but personally, I love all these like little hints at what's happening. It makes the world so much larger than it seems at first, yeah. especially for Way of Kings that takes place in one city and one war area. That's mm -hmm. the whole story. Yeah. Yeah, I liked, um, there were things I like about it, things I didn't like about it. Overall, I thought Way of Kings was good. I would put it above average. Um, I, it drags a lot. The pacing is really slow. Um, yeah. And personally, for my taste, I'm not convinced that the fast ending made up for that slow build completely. Um, so that was something I struggled with. And I also, it took a long time to get attached to any of the characters and some of the characters, even by the end of the first book, I wasn't attached to. Um, okay. So that's kind of hard for me. And I, I we can, I don't want to name characters just because I don't want to like skew anybody's opinion going into the book. Um, exactly. But certain characters for me, I never grew to like, um, which is weird because I know a lot of other readers do like them. 
which is confusing. Yeah, we'll talk but, about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so that was part of it. I like, I don't, I like a book that's pretty 50 50 character and plot. This felt like a character driven book where I didn't care about the characters. And I think that's because you don't really know what the story is. It just seems like you're following these people's lives and you don't really know why for a very long time. I, I could see that. Um, so, it is very character. It is very character driven. And I know, I think I've mentioned this to you and it's a slight spoiler, but uh, how in way of Kings, he focuses on one character's background mm -hmm. and I can't remember who or what characters, but like you have your main set of characters in each book he's picked a different character so far to kind of focus on their background. Mm -hmm. So it's a slow build up on that. Um, I'd say by the end of the second book, you know enough about the characters on whether or not you really like them, I would say. <laughs> okay. Um, it is hard on the first one. Obviously, uh, Kaladin um, is the one character who focuses on the his backstory a little bit more in this book. Um, and he seems to be the focus of this book specifically. Yeah. I would say, um, mm -hmm. I, like I said, I did a re-listen. I did the audio book and it helps with the pacing. Audio books kind of save you from pacing issues. Yeah. I will say though, what you lose by doing the audio book versus the physical book, as I mentioned those little, um, what's the word you call them before each chapter? The epigraphs. The epigraphs, you get those in the audio book, but in the actual physical book, you get all these awesome images yeah and little stuff and i had to i have the um ebooks also and i had to look at them again because i'm like what are I... things like that and um, yeah they're great and it's it's another thing that it helps expand the world expand the story and it's it's very much so like you're getting into oh a world a history of mm -hmm. and it's it's very it, world building heavy which I thought I would like, because I love a big world. I love that. Like all of the stuff Sanderson does in Way of Kings to build the world. I love the epigraphs. I love the interludes, which seem to have nothing to do with the main oh. story. But like, <laughs> I, I love them. Wonderful. I love the sketches. I love a lot of world building. But the first half of Way of Kings, maybe even two thirds of Way of Kings, felt like it was just world building. Like it felt like that's what he was banking on. And it just got to a point where it's like, I need something else. I need to be rooting for these characters. And really by like the halfway point, I was really only rooting for one character or I need a story. I need to know what the conflict is and be rooting for people to win, beat this conflict. And, but we didn't have like a, we have conflict. Like there's things going on, there's people fighting, but we don't know yeah. why, or we aren't invested in it. And that for me was what I just struggled. Um, especially part two, part two, meh. but yeah. in throughout the whole thing, like up until about halfway through part four. So, I mean, at that point, a good like seven, 800 pages into this book, I wasn't completely sold. And if I didn't already know Sanderson and love Sanderson as a writer, I probably would have given up. I probably wouldn't have finished this. <laughs> um, and that's what I was going to say is I feel like this is a project and it's both a positive and a negative is um, I think he went into this and I mean, I hate putting words in an author's mouth sort of thing, but he went into this as a series. He didn't write this first book as a very strong standalone book. Um, mm -hmm. And for those reasons, if you're not a fan of Sanderson, this would be my recommendation. I would not start with this if you've no. never read Sanderson before. Some people recommend this it. as a good starting point, but no. If you're starting Sanderson, you've never read Sanderson before, read something else. I do think this is his best writing I've ever seen, but yeah. I would not start with this because I just, if I didn't trust him already, I would not have made it through. So I don't think start, yeah. don't start with Way of King. If you've never read Sanderson before, I recommend either picking up Warbreaker or Mistborn. But or Elantris. I don't know if I would do Elantris as a starting point, but. I don't know. I haven't read it in a while. I only would say Elantris because both uh, Warbreaker and Elantris being standalone books, it's a one and done. Yeah, it's nice. Um, You get an idea of what, because Sanderson's known for his magic systems. You 
very interesting magic systems. So, a while since I've read Mr. Lee Reed, but any of his other books also, I guess, not in this first book, it doesn't come out, but throughout the Stormlight Archive, um, and this is a slight spoiler, is the Cosmere, which it does mm -hmm. get mentioned in the way of King's, the word Cosmere, but yeah. all of Sanderson's books are part of the Cosmere, mm -hmm. supposedly. I, and in later books in the Stormlight Archive, that stuff comes together, I guess, more. So again, I feel like reading his other stuff is kind of like it builds your foundation to read Stormlight. Yeah. In a weird I, way. Yeah. I, I just was, I didn't really participate in the conversation, but I was like watching a conversation today where somebody was talking about how Stormlight's the only part of Sanderson they're interested in. And you can totally read Stormlight Archive without reading the rest of Sanderson's works, but they do interweave and there is overlap. But it's kind of like if you wanted to only watch the Captain America and Avengers movies in the MCU, you could do it. But if you also yeah. read Thor, watch the Thor and Iron Man movies, you're getting a deeper story. It's kind of like that. You can read just the yeah. Stormlight Archive, but you're going to get more out of it if you also read his other things. Yeah. And I, spoilers for like, there's only one thing I personally have noticed up until the most recent book that was a tie-in to another book by Sanderson. And that was in, I think in book three of the Stormlight Archive or book two, it comes out that there's a yeah, I don't certain know. thing. I know. But, yeah. I don't want to talk about that too much. I guess we can start transitioning into, I guess, would you right. recommend this book? I guess let's do um, that quick before we transition into spoilers. I think the biggest thing is I would not recommend this for a first time Sanderson reader. Um, or either if you've read Wheel of Time, because obviously we're a Wheel of Time focused <laughs> sh uh, channel. If you've read Wheel of Time and you're used to a large epic series, I think you could probably get through reading Way of Kings because you've gone through the whole concept. You know a little bit of Sanderson with the last books of Wheel of Time. I would say take a chance force yourself to get through the first book though because like if you get to the end it really the end picks up and by the end of the first book I think you'll know whether or not you want to read the second one a little yeah. bit if you've not read Wheel of Time you haven't read anything of Sanderson I would say pick up one of his other books first like I said Warbreaker uh the Mistborn trilogy I like Elantris so it gets yeah. you a feel for Sanderson's writing so yeah I kind of feel the same um I think don't pick this up as your first Sanderson I mean if you're experienced in the fantasy genre outside of Sanderson if you've read Malazan or Wheel of Time then I guess you would you would probably be okay picking up Way of Kings without reading Sanderson but if you're trying to get into fantasy this is not where I would recommend you can start I mean you can like I'm not gonna gatekeep and be like you can't do this you won't understand it I just don't think you'll enjoy it and I wouldn't, so I wouldn't recommend it for that reason. Um, but honestly, personally, having not read the rest of the series yet, I don't know that I would recommend Way of Kings. And that seems yeah. like, a, I liked it. Like in the end, I enjoyed it. I think when I did my like calculate, I got, I gave it like four and a quarter stars, which is pretty, like that's good out of five. But I don't think I would recommend it until I know there's gonna be more payoff. So it's kind of, yeah. I got to wait till I read more in the series. So I'm in a weird place because I think it's a good book. I just don't know if it's worth it. It's a lot of work and I don't know if there's the payoff for that work. It's, yeah, it, it's a lot of work. And that's, like I said, I compared it to Wheel of Time. If you've read a 14 book series, if you've read, if you're read Lord of the Rings and the Cim Cimmerillion and you're really into the, the history of Lord of the Rings, I could see again, you could get into it. It's there's so much like we talked about the epitaphs and all the, all the this extra stuff he puts in that the amount of written stuff in way of kings that has nothing to do with what your the storyline of just way of kings but has to do with the greater picture of stormlight those were my favorite parts 
that's the worst. Those were my favorite parts. <laughs> and I, anyway, I guess we could just start transitioning into spoilers at this point so we yeah. can actually talk about things. So if you All haven't right, so read Wave this... Kings, come back another day. Yes. At this point, we're going to move into talking about specifics of characters. I have some questions I have to try to push the conversation because mm -hmm. doing the re-listen, there are just some things that really stood out. And I want to try to be better at this stuff. I'm not, me doing a re-listen, and I did mm -hmm. a re-listen to the whole series before I did Rhythm of War, the most recent book yeah. to come out. And I read Wheel of Time for the first time. And it's stuck in my head really easily. For some mm -hmm. reason, Stormlight Archive, it's like, until I start re-listening to it, I'm like, that's what happened to this book. It's, <laughs> well, it's, it's because it's so slow. Like, for so long, nothing happens. And, like, I literally just read it, and I bet you there's stuff I've already forgotten because it didn't seem important, you know? Man. Um, oh, one yeah. thing I didn't say about the beginning is there's – how it starts and it kind of does a quick like you have the prologue the well there's is, the prelude first or prelude and then the prologue the, um, prelude is the guy the is the radiance or whatever abandoning okay, yeah. their post which That's i right. still haven't prologue, quite figured out what that all meant but i liked it um I, you get some hints i think because the prelude is the guy, is that the thing with the sword and the guy mm -hmm. shows up and puts his sword in the ground? Yeah. It's, this is where I'm like, I don't, I don't want to spoil for you, obviously. Please um, don't. But it's like, that, what I like about it is, I compare it to Wheel of Time, is when you read the prologue from Eye of the World, do you really have any clue? <laughs> right, exactly. And it, it and that's fits what that. It's and I love that. To. I love a good prologue prelude whatever starting to a story that's like what the heck does this have to do with anything exactly it's even it's, like it's... the opening scene of lord of the rings the movies i don't think the book does it but the opening scene in the movies of lord of the rings where it's like this big battle and you're like what, the, what does this have to do with it yeah. like i like that i like it and thrown I... in the middle of something and then leaving it exactly and then the prologue is what is that the... it's seth murdering galvanar oh that's right Galibar. So yeah, I love that kind of stuff it does. I could see the frustration oh, Seth. of I could see the frustration of how you get like weird prelude to eight years ago to then it jumps to like four years later yeah. to like that So can that be a didn't bother me. I don't I think Sanderson's choice to split it up into parts and have different characters in each part, I don't think I liked that choice. Mostly yeah. because I really, really, really hated one of the perspectives. And so it just made those chunks so tedious. Oh, really? Yeah. Alex, so. I would have taken every single Dalinar and Adolin chapter out of this book if I could. You really disliked them that much? I oh. know you had mentioned after you finished, I forget which part you were talking about, how people say they like Dalinar and so Adolin, after like, part two which is part so part one is Shalin and Kaladin part two is Kaladin Adolin Dalinar and then it switches back and forth so after part two part two took me the longest to read because I think I think part two took me like two weeks to read it took me about a month total to read the whole book and I think part two alone took me like two weeks oh, okay um I thought Dalinar was a self-righteous, sanctimonious, pompous butt. And I think Adolin is nothing but a little boy toy. And they drive me up a wall. I could see that in part two. Um, and then, yeah, they do get better in part four, mostly because we see less of Adolin and Dalinar finally starts actually doing something. Also, but, you kind of get more of an explanation. And I like the one line that Sadius says about Dalinar is yeah he's self-righteous but, but he comes by like, it honestly or yeah. whatever and it actually makes me like it more because it's like you know no he's a genuinely good person well I have issues with him as a genuinely good person honestly but he's a good person he's just obnoxious and self-righteous about it <laughs> well and it's it's very interesting and he's he starts to become less judgmental but more judgmental i feel by the end of it because he's starting to take action and yes oh i i have a whole 
questions about the ending. What I, the we'll ending of this book. do the ending later. Yeah. Just because it's like, you have all this stuff you've been told throughout this. Kaladin's, Kaladin's thing comes slowly to you. What's happening with him. Every other Kaladin. character is a huge twist at the end of most. Yeah. Of so I think, well, okay. Shalin, I, and we can talk specifics for the ending later. Shalin, I saw it coming with Shalin and Yasna. I saw what was coming with them. I predicted that in part one. I don't. We'll, we'll come back to <laughs> Some it. of let's, it. Let's come to that. Yeah. Um, um, so, I don't know. We can yeah, go. Whatever you said. Character. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, so, like, that's what I felt about Dalinar and Adolin. Um, I liked Kaladin. I think at the beginning, he was a little too perfect. Like, I don't know. He's the good guy that always says the right thing, no matter how much it hurts him. Uh, but then he got depth later. So I liked um, Kaladin. His crew, Bridge Four, I would die for Bridge Four. <laughs> they are so Obviously. sweet. I love them to pieces. Rock is probably my favorite character in this oh, whole um, novel. Rock or um, the Herdazian, the one on Herdazian? Uh, what's his name? The one that says Goncho. Um, he calls people Gancho, but yeah, I yeah, love yeah. him as a character. In well, it starts with an L. Lopin, Lopin. Um, with all of his cousins, and <laughs> he's great. He and then I mean Sigil, 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 whatever the Sigil, Sigil is interesting. I can't wait till the I want to learn more about singer. him. Yeah, I want to learn more about him. He intrigues me. And then the other one, the one that figured out what Kaladin was doing. Teft. Um, Teft. I also like him, not as much, but Rock is my favorite. Rock, well, Rock and Syl. Syl is delightful. Um, oh, Syl is so delightful. Um, so this is what's interesting about Bridge Four. This is what's, why I say it's so character driven is obviously why I bring up Kaladin is he's the one we get the most his backstory the most, but it's implied that everybody in Bridge Four has a history mm -hmm. right. of some sort. Cause why are because, you in Bridge Four? Yeah. And we get hints at it but we still know so little about these people. Most of them. Oh my God. Well, okay. This, do I even want to say this? I don't trust Moash, but I don't okay. trust him because I, I didn't even see a spoiler, but I saw somebody tweet something or there's a Twitter account that has Moash, their username is Moash did nothing wrong. So now I know he does something that people think he did yeah. wrong. And I'm that's not going to get into it. Right. And we don't need to get into it, but like, I, but even without that, I don't trust him because he's just a little too enthusiastic. Well, I mean, the line that uh, he's like, Kaladin is in it to defend people. Where I'm Moash just after is revenge. For, yeah. He's definitely got that dark side to him yeah. kind of feel. Well, and here's kind of a side note. I am waiting for Adolin's brother, Renarin. I think he's going to become a villain at some point. That's like my bold Ooh. prediction for the series is that Renarin, something happens that he gets spited or something and he snaps because like he's the I'm second brother. Thinking. He's always like, he's thought of as less than than Adolin. And Dalinar did that yeah. whole promise. I promise I'll give you a shard blade, shard plate, whatever. And then I think something's going to happen and Dalinar is going to give plate or shard blade that he wins to somebody above Renarin. And I think Renarin's going to turn dark. But that's like interesting. That's my one big bold prediction is that Renarin's yeah. gonna become a villain. I'm trying that that's the fun thing about doing this. Is I'm trying to put myself in I only know book one and my feelings about characters and things like that. Oh, I like him. I think um, he's and, great. I just think oh, he's gonna see this is what's bad. interesting is the side characters are almost better than the main oh, characters. Oh, totally. Totally. Um Kaladin, I like him. He does have his issues. He drags on me, and this is because I'm an escapist when I want to read fantasy for the most part. <laughs> He's just a little too real. It's, yeah. He's, he gets a little too real. It's just like, and uh, it's good. It's written well. His, I think he, I mean, he clearly has depression, and I think it's a pretty good portrayal of depression. My, yeah only issue with it and this is as somebody that doesn't have depression but has a lot of people around me that have explained what it feels like so take what i say with a grain of salt but the only thing is there's that moment 
when they're doing chasm duty, when he just like snaps out of it, he just decides to stop feeling that way. And that didn't sit well with me. Um, yeah. And I don't know, maybe it'll be handled better going on, but that's the one part of it that didn't sit well with me. But other than that, I think it's a really good de depiction of depression insofar as it's that feeling of hopelessness. It's that feeling of I'm not good enough. It's that tiredness and just wanting to give up. Like, I think it's a pretty good depiction of depression. Well, what I find really interesting about it, and it's what makes it almost obvious, especially on a realist, and that he suffers from depression. He suffered from it his whole life. Right. He talks, talks about, about how in the flashbacks. The weepings and only his brother could bring up I it. I, I didn't realize it as much my first time, but on a realist, and I'm like, wow, he set this up to make it mm -hmm. like he suffers. I don't think it was an extreme depression. I think his circumstances has oh, pushed yeah. him into the more deep depression. He is but I do think he has depression in the like clinical mental health yeah. sense. It's not just like PTSD informed depression. I think he has depression just added and PTSD it, so just made it way, way, way worse. Uh, and it's really yeah. interesting. And I love the little excerpts we get from his past, even though it also hints at there's more to it. Yeah. I, he, he I didn't love his flashbacks. Oh, really? I, I liked parts of them. I liked the more later ones. So like when he's fighting in Amaram's army, like those parts I liked, I thought the scenes between him and his dad were a little heavy handed sometimes at like themes. I think it was a little bit overly foreshadowing some I could see that and I yeah. guess some of that turns out whether or not it pans out but like the whole even a dark eyes can become noble if he wins a shard blade and it's like okay thanks um or you know there was just lines here and there or his spot I mean and it comes back and it's intentionally built so I don't think in the end it was as heavy-handed as it felt in the moment but yeah. reading a lot of those scenes especially between Kaladin and Kaladin and his father it felt very like oh and the moral of the story is you know i have to say i love his mother though oh she's, she's a, delight. a delight and so is um, tian I, tian was uh, such a sweetheart i'm and so sad for tian it's heartbreaking and you know it from the beginning too and that's the worst part is getting all these flashbacks and knowing something's going to happen to him yeah i think my favorite flashback though and this is another thing i'm a sucker for in stories is because early on at the beginning of the book we get this perspective from this kid who's joining Kaladin's squad mm -hmm. who ends up and dying. I liked that I and liked then, getting Kaladin from an outside perspective first I really liked that yeah and then we get to see Kaladin's point of view of the same scene and then continuing on later on in the book yeah. and I really enjoyed that that was cool and finally finding out what exactly happened that made mm -hmm. him a slave like what his betrayal was well because I had so many theories I was like I, I, I was pretty sure I was like, he took down a shard bearer like that. I was pretty sure on, but I wasn't sure what happened that he didn't end up getting the blade and that he ended up a slave. I could not for the life of me figure out how that was going to connect. So I was really cool. I thought what actually happened was a pretty good way to take it. And it wasn't what I would have expected. Oh, I know. Uh, so, and then that's good. I saw that that's all his back. So still, so I love still. how you also learn that pretty much from the beginning of this book that first battle she's been following him there. for so long for a year or something like that it's so and cute. she's such a delight i love sanderson does a good job of writing a character that's at an excelled rate mm -hmm. becoming human but um becoming i don't i don't know what the correct term but sentient so to yeah. speak no, she's, and it's an ex it was fun watching her. Cause like you do, you get from the beginning, she's just like a little bit mis mischievous. She learns what sarcasm is and it's <laughs> like, and I mean, and she's so confident. There's this like moment where she's like talking to Kaladin and she's like, yeah, I'm beautiful. What, what up, you know? And it's like, I, I know. don't know, she's so delightful. I, 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 I liked her a lot. Um, I'm not totally, sold on this whole honor spren thing but mostly because the spren as an entity as a thing just confused me um, oh yeah but this that's part geez. of the world building slash magic in his world that the spren um first of all i gotta say first sill 
she is the most delightful character to listen to in the audiobook. See, too. I don't like her voice in the well. So I listened oh. to the audiobook just for the last like section. I put a hold on my library and I didn't get it until I was like in part four. And I didn't like the voice they gave her because to me, when I was reading it myself, I gave her a very like lighthearted, childlike voice. And then they give her a very serious, like wise was... voice. At least towards I, maybe the because end. Because you only listen to the end. Because it that might definitely have been at the beginning, it's much more childlike. But um, so the spren, since we're talking about so, how do you feel about the spren in general? What the the I'm this concept? I'm so confused. So I think part of it is that I, I think I need to separate them in this thing because I'm hearing this word spren, and my imagination or my thought process initially is that this is like one kind of being right? Like it'd be the same thing. If I said fairy, you picture a specific thing. And I think it's a more general term. Like, I don't know if I said bug, there's about a million things you could picture for a bug. And I think okay. it's more like that. And so that's part of it is getting that into my mind that spren aren't this homogenous thing. Like they come in all shapes and sizes and things. There's that one giant spren that we get in the interlude that like lives yeah, in the ocean. Um, but then so I'm fascinated by them, but I'm so curious. And like, they talk about the one theme that kind of comes up with Spren is that like, do Spren do these things or are they attracted to these things? Yeah. Um, which is really interesting, especially when you think of something like Syl being an honor Spren. Is she helping create honor? Is she like bringing out that honor in Kaladin or is she attracted to Kaladin because he's honorable? Um, True, yeah, very interesting concept. So they're fascinating to me, but I feel like we're just given such small snippets that there's oh, that's, nothing that's I can the figure problem out. problem with the first book. Yeah. Well, it's and the fact that they're not in Shen, where Shen is like the mountain range stops the high storms from getting it, oh, and there yeah, aren't Spren at. there. And it's um, like, how, yeah, what is that connection? I just, I, mean, I okay. want to know more. The only, the Spren are really interesting, and I don't, in a later book, I think you get a picture from Shallan's notebook where she sketches Spren. Oh. Um, so now, okay, you bring up the Shen. Mm. We get that one interlude where we get to see that. How curious were you about this concept? It's like, it's so different than the whole rest of the world. There's well, and it's Right. And it's because the, I mean, that to me made, like, made a lot of sense. And I really liked it because like the environment is so impacted by everything and so like you could have a completely different ecosystem when you have it sheltered from these high storms right you don't need your grass to retreat because it's afraid of you know you don't need all these things uh, yeah um i know it's so, so i think that was cool i think it's interesting that like we're getting snippets that there's even further things like the fact that there aren't spren in this nation yeah but i, I think about that. what's in focus I think what's weirder to me is the fact that I'm about to sneeze. No, I'm not. Okay. I think what was weirder to me is that the rest of the world felt so homogenous and it's just Shen that's different. But we'll, well see. Because, Maybe we'll see more, but I mean we get a couple of different things is obviously first of all, yeah, he creates this awesome world where there's these high storms which are so important because it's the storm light and it makes everything glow for these the, the gems glow and it's their light stuff, but also all of life, most of your animals, like what few animals we have, have carapace of mm -hmm. some sort. Yeah. Except for the chicken um, and horses, but you know. Well, and horses are and then, rare and they're owned by people and they're taken care of. Yeah. And then all of your plants, they have some kind of a shell. They bring in their leaves. It's such an awesome concept, I think. It's so interesting. It's so hard to even like imagine it because it's so drastically different I mean, than the reality. That's why That's why I think the books are much better because you get some pictures. I, I was doing a quick scroll through. I think there's a picture of an axe hound. Yeah, those are one weird. Of them. Well, because it's so hard to imagine and stupid animals. The table of contents doesn't actually label all of the illustrations for some reason, but yeah. I think that one was maybe. Um, I think I remember seeing the axe hound, but I think some of the other images were like, one was like a notebook page, I think is what it was supposed to be. But so you get this such an interesting concept of that. And then, yeah, you have the Shen, which is completely different. You get the one interlude from the Clear Lakes, 
which seems like such a huge leap. Is that the one with the two ardents doing research on? No, the Clear Lakes was the guy who he's like fishing. Oh, the fisherman. I forgot about him. That was like the first one. Yeah, which is also a very interesting concept of these people who. That's the X sound. Yes, it's like weirdly bug like. Bug like. Also... Everything is like bug like or crab like or. Because now... what I put at the beginning was one of like what the chols look like. Yeah. And also, I don't know if you've noticed this um, yet, is I think it's the word kremling. Yeah. Has been so what used. krem is the like mud that gets deposited after a storm and it yeah. like hardens and kremlings are like a type of bug. I think it's this is something Brian Sanderson did in this book. Kremling refers to just about any small creature. Oh. They don't have a lot of because it's I think it's used several different times at different points to mention um, uh, different kind of like, oh, look at these Kremlings. Look, it's like saying bug almost. Yeah. Actually. Um, and he does that throughout and it's not as pertinent in this first book. You'll notice it when you get into later books. He does it with a couple other things. The other thing that it's all wine. Oh, yeah, yeah, all yeah. Al- I think they do mention beer, but no, I don't think so. I think it's all whether it's purple wine, orange wine. And it's like he does this weird thing where he uses just general terms for everything that's the same. Which that's one's good. this? It's the shale bark and there's the little drawings of oh, yeah. at the bottom. But, um, so it's really interesting how he decides to, rather than coming up with new names for every single small creature there is they're just all right. kremlings well and it's it makes it almost difficult for me as a reader to like picture what's going on because the fact that like this one it's the same thing with the spread you're using one word to describe such a wide variety of things so it's just yeah. kind of difficult sometimes as a reader to be like what do you Trying mean to think, here what all do we we get introduced we get told about wind spread Oh God, flame, there's so many. Spren, Wind, flame, pain. pain. The f- most interesting are the emotionally based ones. Right, inspiration or creation spread. Um, yeah. Rot spread, death spread, theoretical. Well, no, we get confirmed because there's that scene where Syl, bless her heart, is fighting the death spread oh, coming God. after Kaladin. Ugh. Um, there's whatever the weird spread, and we haven't talked about the ending totally yet, but there's the spread that shawl and seas yeah. um yeah. which are creepy that whole scene when she's like just... rushing back from the library oh. to her room <laughs> was horrifying i, I, I in my books head don't scare want... me that much but that was horrifying to me you want to know what i always think of in my head i forget if they give them a name but i always think they're like the illuminati's friend that's what goes into my head for some reason i think they're named but this is when i was listening towards the end so like some of the um, specifics get forgotten um and yeah. i can't read because i don't want my glasses on um, oh, yeah, there are so many sp- yeah we concepts get of so many there may or may not be uh intoxication spread we don't know yet <laughs> oh, that yeah, was probably oh. of all of the interludes that one was probably my favorite that one and the shen one with the trader the shaman with the favorites. trainer was interesting, but now the, the spring collector was probably my favorite. It was funny. I want a whole book of just his adventures. Like, like all the interludes are good. Like, I mean, um, the one about the spread guy is what I like most about that is he's some weird other kind of person. Right. Cause he has that whole like tattoo thing. He has he complete can... control over his own physical makeup. It seems mm-hmm. he can, he says he's going to, take care of his bruises later to make him go away right like what Um, is he i have no idea um he's interesting yeah his was probably my favorite the one that confused me because like most of them i could see where they fit in we got the one from shalin's brother i mean we're not going to talk about seth because i'll cry um (laughs) it right every single one of his chapters just crushed me all right because it's just him murdering people and feeling so bad and it was just miserable to read um so seth 
Shalin's brother, there's the Fisher guy, the Spren collector, there's the two ardents that are studying flame Spren. Yeah, which is so crazy about that concept. Like, if you observe them, they, it's, it's yeah, so it's, strange. which is fascinating. And is that true of all Spren or just flame Spren? I just want more. I want more about oh, those. I know. Um, what were the other ones? There is the one that confused me the most that I did not understand in the slightest was the one for the lady that was breaking all the art. So, okay. I have now no idea is, what that means. <laughs> what so that had one, to do with anything. First of all, what's interesting is that seems to come out of nowhere. Also, really? talking, well, no, talking about that. I wish I could have gone chapter by chapter with you and gone over all of the different um, epitaphs. Mm -hmm. that's what epigraphs. Epitaphs. epitaphs are what you put on gravestones epigraph okay. is what they're so because okay the interludes are one thing that are out there so about the epigraphs so oh, they're interesting oh, yeah do you know what a lot of them were i made? don't know what all of them are i'd have to look again the first part well, all and of the ones that the said fourth part were collecting people's last words okay i forgot when i was and, listening to it i was like do I want to ask about it? And it wasn't until I got to the end of the book and I'm like, okay, yes, you it do. It does kind of, yeah, yeah, it explains it. I mean, I had picked up on that already. Um, so that was the first and the fourth one. The second one, I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, yeah, I really don't yeah, know what the strange. second one was. The third that part. Like it was like somebody writing a letter to somebody. Yeah, it was like some sort of correspondence. The third part was. Yasna's notes on the void bringers yes and then i have no idea what the fifth part was because that's when i was listening on audiobook i don't even know if there I were think, any there weren't any i don't think the fifth part no because the fifth part was just kind of like here's what everybody is yeah um so the ones that were people's last words do you realize what the collection of them all were from the ending of the book no, I mean, I like, so I know there was, you? well, there was the guy that Seth met with that he's like collecting last words, like he's like, has a bunch of people that are dying. And like, he's collecting their word last words. So, so that's what I mean. It's implied that all of these similar to like Yasna's notes, that maybe these are all like ones he's collected in his hospital. Interesting. Interesting. Wait, that's was how that? I... Okay. You don't, you don't realize who Seth met at the end? No, it was an audiobook. I, I don't always pay attention to names. Now I gotta like. What city did he go to last? Give me a second. This is what I get for switching to the audiobook when things get exciting. And this is what I mean about the. Ending. Was he in so Carpro? Many... Yes. Oh my God, really? Nope, not Wit's chapter. Bless Wit. I have feelings about Wit too, but anyway. Oh, Wit is wonderful. Okay, so that was, oh, so that was, in, oh, interesting. Yes, okay. Taravangian. Interesting. This dawdling guy who has hospitals and is a great guy has used Seth to kill a bunch of people and he's killing people in his hospitals to get their last words. Weird. There was one, the one that I picked out and I don't remember what chapter it is and I'm not going to look for it. One of them was specifically, it made a reference to the tower and the crown and the spear. And I was like, that's Kalinar, at Adolin, Dalinar, and Kaladin. Because that's what their chapter icons are. Um, I, so, didn't, I don't, didn't realize that. Yeah, so. Chapter icons. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Dalinar's and Adolin have like, it's like a shield that has a crown and a tower on it. And then Dal okay. and then Kaladin has like a spear and a flag. Mm -hmm. And then I don't um, remember what Shalins is. I think it's like a mask or something. I don't know. But the thing with the epigraphs is there is one that refers to the interlude you were confused about. Oh, well, now I have to go back and read them all. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I just had a whole collection of them. I don't know how obvious it is unless you're paying attention and know more. Honestly, I, I probably will go back and reread them at some point because um, I don't trust Sanderson and his epigraphs. But... I, um i guess um, if, yeah go ahead even re-listening to them i'm like some of them stand out some of them i'm just like um one a lot of them you would only know on re-listens and i'm not gonna 
because yeah don't don't yeah, don't try to like push me to them um there were some though but like i could have sworn when maps died the words that he screamed when he was dying i could have sworn i had already read those words but i have the ebook and i like scrolled through the ebook i searched through the ebook i thought it was one of the epigraphs and i couldn't find it and now i feel like i'm going crazy but I could have sworn his last words were ones that had been used before. So so how interesting was that one where you've been getting these epigraphs of like people's last words. And then when he dies, he gives last words like that. How kind of I know. It's freaky. <laughs> right. And that's what it was. Like, I was like, I swear we've already had this. I swear we've, and I couldn't find it. And so I like felt like I was, same with, I think it was, <laughs> and what, I don't know. And when it, I don't know, I swear I was going crazy, but um. Uh-huh. Dunny, I don't know if Dunny no. had anything crazy. No, he died because like nobody was there when he I died and then he got trampled. Um, rip Dunny. Um, okay, so the one character we really haven't Funny, talked about ha- is we haven't I really- I did have a question about if you had predictions yeah. about any of those pre-death speeches, which is funny. The only one that stood out, like really stood out to me and I think it was like chapter 55 or 56, somewhere like that. Cause I remember I had like bookmarked it to talk to my friend about, um, but was- it was one that was like the spear and the sh- sword and the something stand together. Yeah. Um, but, oh, here it is. It's chapter 53. Oh, it's when Dunny dies. Rip. Um, it says, he must pick it up. The fallen title, the tower, the crown, and the spear. Uh, that was the only run. For, and it's from a pop prostitute, apparently. Anyway. That's what's also interesting as it lists who these people are. Yeah. Like it matters. I mean, maybe it does. Um, But that was the only one that really stood out to me of like, well, that's clearly about Adolin, Dalinar and Kaladin to me anyway, it seems obvious, but whether it is or not, but that's the only one that really stood out. Um, Yeah. But the only characters we really haven't talked about yet are Shallan and Yasna. So because uh, I want to do before we get to them, because we, talk about okay. Dalinar and there's only the one thing two things I had about Dalinar mm-hmm. first of all his crazy love for Nabani is so oh confusing my freaking to god oh my god I hate it I've <laughs> never cared for somebody that much that I had this burning passion for him that many years later after they were married so you're just as confused by that craziness well it's me. not just that it was just from the moment she shows up, Dalinar is immediately like, I am into her, but she's my sister. And I'm like, I, this is just not a dynamic I need in my books. I don't need an, okay, so I'm in love with as... somebody that's basically my sister. I don't need it. And okay, then it just so got worse. And then we find out it was a, I chose him over you because your feelings were unclear situation, but I really would have picked you. And I'm just like, this is uncomfortable. And it feels like, while I'm sure I will later don't tell me, but I'm sure later I'll figure out why Dalinar traded the memories of his wife. I'm sure we'll get to that eventually. Oh, so but that's it, what you're saying happened? <laughs> but I feel like it's a shorthand to get, it's like a little shortcut. So it's okay for Dalinar to be with Navani because he can't even remember his wife. So it's not him betraying the memory of his dead wife. It's because he can't even remember her. So what does it matter? Okay. It just... The no, whole just, situation was weird, but so I was, it was fine. just as weird for you. Yeah, uh, but when they finally start getting together, I was like, fine, finally. I just need was, somebody to do something. <laughs> that was going to be my question. By the end of the book, when they've decided, yeah. By then it was okay like, with them being together? yeah, oh yeah, I'm okay with them being together. The thing that made me uncomfortable was how uncomfortable Dalinar was. So like when Navani, find, when they like finally get to that moment where they kiss, I'm like, just thank God somebody finally like did okay. something about this. Um, and then, like the scene, right. Dalinar just wa- whooping <laughs> Elokar was no. very good. Um, and the like, as he leaves, and he's like, "By the way, your mother and I are courting," and like storms out. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I know it's well, that's one way to do it. Well, and that comes on the tail of Kaladin just bossing Adolin around, and I felt so good during that whole scene oh where he's just like ordering adolin and i'm just like this is this is everything i want (laughs) just everything about like the last part four um with kaladin with all of a sudden he deciding to like have the armor and the shield and dodging the arrows is so amazing to him saving dalinar it's all crazy but the other thing with dalinar is the visions 
So I how, liked, what did you think of the visions? I liked the first one and then they got kind of tedious to me. Well, I think the first one I kind of liked, but it felt like it went on for too long. And I was like, what's the point of this? You know, it just kind of kept going. Um, and then afterwards, his few, the visions that we get later, I don't know, it kind of, it's like the dream sequences in Eye of the World, where it's like, at first it's like, this is neat. And then it's like, okay, I'm sick of it. Um, it kind of felt a little bit like that. And it was just a lot of, I'm not sure what your point is here. And then, so I- You I've, seeing the distant past. I know when I get that, but like, I don't know. I'm not seeing just yet how they all fit in. And because I just don't like Dalinar, it just was like, it almost made him interesting. And I was like, uh, I don't know. So that was, I it was- know. I think the- Yeah, go ahead. I like the visions because you get some cool. It's again the opening up the history of the world. If these visions are real, obviously, because well, we and still we know question the we know they're, they're real. We don't yeah, know because who's he's translating them. Yeah, the only thing that really bothered me about them it was the tropiness of he's trying to talk to the visions and he thought the visions told him to trust Sadius. Yeah, it kind of seemed like, like an easy way to get him to trust I him, hate, but I don't I hate think that, that was... trope. I don't think it was necessary, honestly. I think he would have trusted him anyway, because like he and Sadius have I that. I know, whole... but he then blames the visions later for it. Right. Is what I, and then I hate it that becomes trope a scapegoat. Of... Yeah. It, it's a trope in some things where it's like you're talking to somebody and you think they're talking back to you, but really it's just a recording. So you come to implications that aren't really it's I it annoys yeah. me that No, uh, yeah, I get that. I yeah, I don't I think when we learn more about if we learn more about the visions maybe they'll be more interesting to me but right now they just kind of felt like they were disrupting the story which is fine because Not i was even. okay with the story being disrupted because i didn't want to hear I, more I about see. adolin and dalinar's politicking but <laughs> i could see most of them i would say the only vision i would say definitely is really good is i love the one with the night radiance just leaving their swords and armor and walking that away. was a cool one that was creepy there was something very eerie about that but like again it felt like it went on too long because then it like a little i could drags little on bit. into like everybody fighting and it's like okay i get the idea they're fighting over the shard plate you can stop there but then it just keeps going okay, and i think that's I could see that part yeah. of it again the pacing issues like i said i listen to the audiobook yeah. so that stuff doesn't stand out to me as much right and i i think that's totally fair. If I had done the whole thing in audiobook, I don't think I would have had as much issue. But trying to read it physically and ebook, it just, it really did. The pacing really slowed yeah. down sometimes. All right. So let's get to our other two characters. I think we talked Alan about and everybody. Yasna. Shalon and Yasna. Yes. Yeah. I don't pronounce um, it right. First of all, this this does bring up the concept of religion. We have our first pronounced <laughs> atheist in Yasna. What do you think about this religion? I think it's interesting that Sanderson is exploring that because so often in fantasy, religion is just like accepted. Like people might celebrate worship differently, but like the idea that there is a divine creator is generally accepted in the world because like there's some sort of magic that proves that the creator is real. So I think it's interesting that like we're getting that exploration, but to be honest, it's not the most interesting element to me. Like actual I, religion. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I I just I'm I'm glad we're getting it, and I think it's good, and I think it's interesting, and I like applaud him for doing something a little bit different. But and I liked some of it. Like I really any moment sh where Shalon and Yasna and the not ardent that broke my heart. Um, anytime, the <laughs> <laughs> so mad about that. Anyway. Yeah, I know. Anytime they were like talking philosophy, whether it was about religion or the lesson Yasna gives Shalin on morality was so cool to me. So like those moments, I really, really enjoyed. The philosophy. Yeah. Well, philosophy, but, um, I know the, those kind of moments I really enjoyed but I think sometimes I think it's hard to avoid real world religious religious implications when you're doing that kind of religious criticism in your fantasy book. And I just for me, yeah, that's something I don't necessarily want to confront in my fantasy. So I think it's well done. I don't have any qualms with it being there. And I applaud Sanderson for trying to have that discussion in fantasy because I think it's often left out of fantasy. 
but it's just not an element I look for or care about, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. I just, I, th- I think it's an interesting concept of this whole, like, you know, people were kicked out of heaven by the void bringers. And so now you're calling as you want to do your best. And it's got a very Valhalla weird. vibe. Yeah. It's got this weird Valhalla vibe almost where it's like right. warriors are the most important um, because <laughs> When you die, you're going to join God's army and f- trying to take back the Tranquiline Halls. Really interesting. But what everybody is going to have a role based on what their calling is, and, then, and it's yeah, but it's that's interesting. Kind of strange. I do like the concept though of the Ardents and how it's like. Hey, I like the concept of this passion. It's like you choose what you're passionate about, and it's in a non. We're in a fantasy. You always have like schools there aren't schools uh, is a qu- question in fantasy a lot and it seems like everybody having their calling and then the ardents helping people heighten their calling is like a strange kind of schooling in a way no i think it's cool i think the culture he builds is really interesting i think the gender division is interesting Ooh, I, I hope I it's know. something i hope it's something we kind of start seeing explored and subverted a little more um, cause so far other than Yasna and sometimes Navani, everybody just kind of blindly accepts the gender roles. It's so I'm such kind of a weird concept too. Right. So I'm kind of hoping that something will, and it's so it's every minute, it's not just like women cook and men do this. It's women eat sweet foods, men eat spicy foods and <laughs> it's, know, it's everything, hilarious. literally every element of their life. I don't understand this whole safe hands thing weird i i don't know if that I ever gets make a gender bent yet i almost want to make a gender bent yasna costume go for it with the whole i want to make a sil costume I, I i kind of oh, want to make yeah. a sil costume at some point but not like now but i would love to make um, something for her but um yeah so like that's interesting and i'm hoping we see that kind of subverted or challenged more as we go forward um, um I'm just because think. i don't it's the same thing with like the fact that this world has fantasy racism, right? It also has fantasy gender roles. And I don't like having those things just exist and not be challenged. Um, and obviously the uh, racism yeah, get is that. getting challenged. So I'm hoping the gender roles get challenged a little. And we, like I said, Yasna does it some, like she doesn't like sweets that much. And so like, I think it'll be interesting to see that challenged a little more going forward. Um, yeah, I like Yasna. Uh-huh. I love Part Yasna. of the thing is obviously we're focused on the Alethi as a culture. Mm-hmm. We hear about a couple other cultures, but it seems like culture and religion is very much the same. And this gender role seems to be more based on it's it's part culture, part religion, because you mm-hmm. always hear about these other cultures follow the same religion, sort of. Yeah. So we don't know if this gender dynamic is prevalent in every culture. I mean, the Shen, for instance, we already know are completely different. They don't mm-hmm. walk on stone. Do, do they have a gender dynamic like that? So it's the Alethi are such a strange people there to begin with. So wacky. But okay, so Shalon. I just so, walk into Alucard and flash my left hand at some people and watch <laughs> men faint. <gasps> I know. Gosh. I'm such a... Anyway. I think it's a cool... <laughs> that co- scene... Honestly, the scene where uh, Adolin rescues the like hooker um, and Kaladin's there, like her left hand was exposed. <gasps> Be still my beating heart. Her left hand. I must I have honestly, burnt my eyes. <laughs> I, was just, I like, think it's cool. a cool concept. <laughs> no, I think it's cool. And I think it really highlights the differences in like propriety and honestly ha- how ridiculous some of our concepts of propriety are. Like the fact that you can't show your shoulders in a public school or you know, yeah. that certain things are considered sexual. It like highlights that, but it was just that entire scene. I was like losing it. Cause I was just like, well, oh I my know, God, Kaladin, just... take a deep breath. It's just a hand. Oh, and the concept of the lowborns will just wear a glove and that's good enough. But to Shalon at first, it's like, oh, just a glove. Right. And the whole idea that like, well, you could still see their hand. It's just covered and it's, it's not. It's, it's, it is really awesome. Yeah. No, but I think it's, it's interesting. It also makes for some crazy concepts of an outfit, like having that one sleeve long. Well, and it's thing. got and it's got a pot like the pouch that goes in it, which is well, like it's interesting is because at first 
and even on the re-list, I'm like, there's a pocket in there. And then it, you realize she has a pouch that kind of like, it, it like a button buttons on the inside. In. Right. But there's still space for there to be like a pouch buttoned in her sleeve. Yeah. Um, it's so, yeah, well, it's it folds neat. up because it's like, it folds over too. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have, um, so you have your hand in there and it buttons around. And I'm guessing like the same button that buttons the sleeve closes, maybe what the pouch gets buttoned to. I don't know. But That's it's why got, I want to try to make one. It's a pretty big pouch too, because like Shaolin keeps the uh, soulcaster, um, soul caster, in it as well as a stone. I wonder how big the um, spears are, though. We don't really get a good idea. About marble size. Are they okay? Because like un- at the beginning, I was picturing them like big, and I was like, "How is somebody going to keep a pouch of like these?" And then I was like, and "They must be like it's this." Almost more so, you know, like the rocks you get for in a fish tank. Yeah. Oh, so they're not they're almost circular. Probably, I think they're more like that. Well, it does mention at one point they have one. Oh, because one side is flat. a little bit. Yeah, but I, I don't think, think they're. It's, where is this? It's almost more like my glow. I mean, smaller than this, but like this has just the one side is a little bit flat, so it doesn't roll. Yeah, I know. I the fish tank things I think are a little too flat, but um, because. I'm trying to, and I almost want to try to get things like these made. It would be cool. Like this is. I think marbles is probably about right. Like a marble with like a little bit of a flat side. Well, like imagine, you know, the marbles, like the classic cat eye one, the swirl in the middle. That cat eye is probably the size of your most more expensive ones. I just from the sound. It's such an interesting money, like not like the concept of like these are things that are like hold our magic and yada 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 is cool and how that would become a form of currency but also just the idea that your currency is like beads uh and not like something more well practical. They, they have gemstones in them right um but it's anyway it's because it's because their money it's why it holds over is the concept of fabrials in your soul casters in the religion when you realize that the money you have, the gems can be used to create food out of nothing. Right. Create stuff like that. It powers these awesome like heat heaters and things mm-hmm. like that. It'd be like, imagine if we captured electricity and used it for money. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's cool. So, I think it's cool. It seems like a more tangible concept of currency to me than the real world yeah because there's actual like value to it and not just this artificial value that we instill in it because we say it's something i have increasingly become weirdly radical in regards to money and we don't need to have oh, that conversation here <laughs> but I, um but okay money is so fake. shallan <laughs> so shallan so i like shallan um she's probably for just the first book she might be my favorite character really interesting so my Um, friend that i'm reading with doesn't like her he thinks she's annoying um and i can see that but i like her i think she's kind of spunky i she reminds me very much of early Egwene in wheel of time like probably around like book four or five Egwene. she she reminds me of that like she's somebody in a book i don't know if it was in this or something else that i was thinking about Egwene that i thought was the epitome of all the bad parts of Egwene in my life. <laughs> oh, wow. Shallan's, uh, no, Kaladin's opinion about the light eyes Oh is yeah, so it's... Egwene and the Shan Chan. Right, and it's reasonable. And, we, and it uh, bothers me so much. It bothers me, but also I understand it. And like, it's frustrating, but it's also reasonable. And yeah, it's believable. Obviously it's hard for me. I'm, I'm a white male, whatever. I have never been so beaten down by anybody i've been bullied was the closest thing to it but to hold such resentment right. as a group of people is so hard for me to grasp right to but that it's extreme also very reasonable if it's a group of people that have hurt you and disappointed you and attacked you at every possible point you know every he time he trusts them every time he trusted a light eyes though they turned against him right like and it's not just those two it was officers and other military in the militaries throughout times it's the I other guess, light yeah, eyes he was owned by right it's just well, Amaran right, then he was a and... slave once you become a slave obviously it's like you <laughs> right. can't really but so but, yeah no, no, okay, sorry Shalon, so, so. Shalon. yeah i like her i think she's spunky i'd probably describe her as monkey i don't think she'd be my favorite if i were gonna rank 
just the point of view characters, I would put Kaladin above her, but Kaladin then Shallan. Uh, if I was going to throw in some other characters, I would put Yasna as my favorite. I love uh, Yasna. Well, I yeah, Yasna is my favorite. And I don't know if you saw the thing where, um, I don't know, uh, somebody was going to do a fantasy draft or whatever on characters. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they've done that video yet. And I was thinking to myself, I think if I was going to pick somebody from Stormlight, I would pick Yasna. Well, and it's interesting because we don't ever get her perspective, right? We're only ever seeing her from Shalin's perspective, and then we're hearing about her through Dalinar's perspective. Um, so that or might Dalinar, be part of it. Yeah. Eh, well, Dalinar. I, I, for, um, for reasons, but... Um. Uh, but she is so interesting to me. And I think for me, the turning point with her, because before I was like, she's cool. She's like a scholar. I think that's neat. She's subverting like expectations of her culture. Good for her. But then but that moment that- Because being a scholar is normal for women. Right. No, not being a scholar, but like know, the fact but... that she's a heretic or the fact that she doesn't yeah, that necessarily conform to all gender roles expected well, no, but of see, her. This is what's interesting because it's mentioned she is a heretic and she's all about the scholarly, but she's also a perfect woman. She always presents herself in a perfect light. Right, but she doesn't like necessarily, she doesn't like the foods that women are supposed to like. Like, yeah. but she does do the things she's supposed her to. Her like. private, in the public, her public image is the perfect. Yes. But privately, and yeah. obviously she's a heretic in public, but you know, uh, <laughs> her private mm, so much, yeah, she does subvert it on a personal level, but her she holds the perfect image till and it's a duality with her that I find interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, but the tipping point for me was definitely when she took Shalon out and killed those guys and was just like, did I do the right thing? Here's your lesson, figure it out. I was just like, I'm into mm-hmm. it. I'm so, I love a character. Absolutely love a character that's going to do the practical thing and not complain about it, not, be beat themselves up about it that this is the right thing for me to do because it's going to make the world a better place or it's going to improve this problem i'm going to do it i i love it and that was the tipping point for me i was like yeah i love yasna (laughs) i simp for yasna although i still think she did the wrong it's it's the that that scene will always be a questioning thing and it's great philosophical well and then the way like shallan then does the research and comes back and is like legally you were right but morally not and this is why i think this and based on all of these things if you're seeking the trouble it's not like she was walking this street just because she was walking this street right well it's it's it wasn't self-defense it was premeditated (laughs) It was premeditated, but they attacked her, right? Like, so like it was, she did things intentionally to draw them out so that she could defend herself, but they were still the instigators, right? And so it's it's, this, it's, I love it. I just love it so much. I thought it was really, and that was the tipping point for me. I was like, I love Yasna. I'm not, I don't know what she could possibly do to make me not love her. And like everything said, at the end and how she handled everything with Shalin at the end, I was like, good for her. Oh, I'm, also, like I said, the side characters, even if you take the Dalinar part away from it, Navani seems like a really interesting I like person. Navani. She's interesting to me. I don't trust her, but she's interesting to me. It's, again, because we only hear about her from Dalinar. And right. It's like, and Dalinar is like, oh, I love her. To, and Adolin's like, like, this is my favorite aunt. I love her. And oh, I'm I love like, their relationship. I'm it's sorry. It's so Adolin cute. With it's Amazing. about the only time I like Adolin. But no, okay, so Shalon coming here. First of all, we do learn from pretty early her whole plan is to steal the soul cast. Right, so we get that early on. So, so this, yeah. Early on, what did you think about Shalon? Would you have ever predicted how it was going to end, what her she so, said about her past? So initially, no. Um, but she hints very, pretty early on, it's hinted at that she's done bad things before. Yeah. I don't remember when specifically she starts thinking about that, but yeah, she, she does. Yeah, she talks about stuff. She like, because it starts doing things where she starts to think about what happened in the past and she's like no don't think about that she's obviously right. shut out a lot of her past right so I predicted fairly early on I don't know exactly when it was I'd have to like go look back at my messages and stuff that she had killed her dad I predicted that okay. pretty early I on could, I could see and it. I think and this hasn't been confirmed as far as ways king of kings is so don't tell me if I'm right I think she has a shard blade I think her dad had a shard blade because we know Why? in that kingdom wait we know in that kingdom, okay, so why I initially thought this, there's a moment before she soul casts 
there's a moment she's like, I swore I was never going to use this again. And then it starts counting her heartbeats. I'd have to find the exact quote, but, and then well, it starts counting I, her heartbeats. I know beats. what you're talking about. And obviously like, um, without, con- <laughs> I thought the same thing in first book, because there's <laughs> another scene where she holds her hand out. Right. And yeah, and then she holds her hand yeah, out. I'm like, I know exactly I think, what you're talking about. So I, my theory is that Shalon has a sharp blade. Sharp blade. I don't know how she got it, but I think she does. And then later on, during Seth's one interlude where he's killing all of the people in the king or whatever of her yeah. kingdom, um, yeah, it talks about how he secretly had a shard blade and that he thinks there's more shard blades in this kingdom than the Alethi suppose or whatever. So I was like, I think her father secretly had a shard blade and that she killed him and got a shard blade or somehow she got his shard blade and then killed him or something there. Okay. I think, but whether that's true or not, that's, those are my two, my two big outstanding predictions for the rest of the series. Shaolin has a shard <laughs> blade and Adolin's brother is going to turn evil. <laughs> those are my um, two bold predictions. So, so you, so you weren't completely surprised at the end where for and, her to convince mm-hmm. Yasna that she had been to shades marsh. She's like, Oh, she had to tell a truth and she's like i killed my father yeah nope that one didn't su- much. that didn't surprise me and then the fake fabriel didn't surprise me either i well i mean i don't think i predicted it any earlier than most people would have but when like once shallan went to the weird shades mar thing i'm assuming the first uh, time oh no that's much earlier than i got it i got it um oh. when the uh poisoning. yeah during the poisoning when the Yasna same. was trying to heal yeah. her and Shalom was like getting the thing out. I was like, I don't think I had kind of be... thought it before, but like that was the first time I was like, I don't okay, cause think Miana the Fabriel was ever real. Miana re listened because when Shalon goes the first time and she turns the cup to blood, <laughs> I already knew so, what that implied with her right. going to that other world. Well, so like world. I that I knew wasn't because of the Fabriol. I didn't think the Fabriol had anything to do with her going. Um, that's not what my thought was. I thought that was her. Okay. But but that didn't confirm you thinking no, that. No, it wasn't until was Sha- yeah, yeah, it wasn't until Yasna went to heal her that I was like, wait, I don't think the Fabriol was ever real. Um, so. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, it's again. That this is the problem with doing it on a re-listen. Is I'm like the whole time I'm like, okay, what? Well, well, I'm trying to remember her storyline because I'm like, obviously, when Shalon starts saying, "I stole this like two weeks ago," why hasn't she mentioned it? I'm thinking in my head because she doesn't need it, right? <laughs> the whole well, time once, in my own head, like, I knew. Yeah, and once it like clicked for me that I thought that was happening, then it was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So that was yeah, and I like being right. I'm very rarely right. The stupid ardent. I was wrong on him. Oh my gosh. My I friend know, was like, so... well, and the thing is like, to me, the reason why I didn't think he was going to betray her was because it seemed so obvious. I was like, there's no way that's what he's actually doing. Sanderson but literally that... told us that's what he might be doing. So Even obviously that's not obvious. what he was doing. Even from the obvious standpoint, did you really expect the poisoning concept? No, it's specifically how he was going to do it. But like, I thought it was too obvious that he was using Shalin to get to Yasna to whatever he was going to do with Yasna, whether I didn't think actually kill her, but to me, it was just too obvious for that to be his plot that he was using Shalin to get to Yasna. So I was like, nah, there's no way that's what it actually oh, is Definitely. because that's too obvious. And then it was that and I was like, now I'm I mad. I, I really it's thought he loved her. Obvious. I also, oh my God, the concept that, do you realize he's been bringing bread and jam all these times? Right, and every and, single time. And it was so ingenious, too. The bread was the poison. The jam, which Yasna doesn't eat, was the antidote. I mean, that's clever. That's a clever way to murder somebody. But, know, like, it's... yeah, it was just... And I I did... I Their awkward flirting was adorable. I honestly oh, thought I he really liked her and i i thought he was gonna die but i thought it was gonna be like an accident so like early on if i thought it was wasn't... what i thought early on was that shalin was gonna get away with the fabriel and he was gonna take the blame was what i thought was gonna happen um interesting but yeah i don't know i didn't root for shalin at any point i like her as a character but i wasn't rooting for her mostly because i didn't like her 
plot of like steal the Fabriel, go back and help my terrible brothers. Like I was like, I don't want her to do that. So I don't want to see her succeed, but I but like I her. I like the struggle because of it. The fact that she starts to like Yasna and she starts to doubt and she doesn't want to do it. And then the murder is what pushes her to want to be. She's like, wow, Yasna's a horrible person. So I am going to steal it. And then she feels bad. I like that struggle. Oh yeah, has. no, it's a good moral dilemma she goes through. But like, that's just it. I wasn't rooting for her to achieve her goals. I was rooting for her to figure her thing, her exactly, life out. Yeah, pretty um, much it, to get where it ended up. Maybe not exactly that. Like, I wanted her to. <laughs> yeah, I don't I know about wanted, exactly that. I always but, want her to stay with the Asna sort of thing. It was just interesting because like her thing, because we get her sketches and stuff. So she really reminded me of Lady Trent. Not in like the same oh. way because she's not like subverting gender roles and she's not like a pioneer in her field. But there was something about her that was like, it was a little Lady Trent like. And so that kind of made yeah. me like her. But And honestly, Capsule, who is the Arden, if he hadn't tried to kill Yasna, he might have been one of my favorite minor characters. I love his it, personality. As a minor character, I really liked him. I mean, yeah. honestly, I like him as a villain, finding out that he was trying to kill Yasna, because it's like, man, he's pretty clever. All right, good for him. Yeah. So what about the connection that he had a tattoo similar to the person from Shalon's household? Well, and here's the, the thing. The ghost and, bloods. Yeah, the ghost bloods. And I'm wondering... I see, well, I had thought and that maybe Seth, the people that had Seth's oath stone that was making him kill people, I had thought maybe he was also connected with that. But then, of course, we find out at the end he's not. I, I don't... I love the surprises at the end. Yeah. yeah there's Finding so out it's King Teravangian. And, oh, Ter oh, my gosh. Um, but yeah, that's it's interesting. I don't have a lot of thoughts on that, but like... I don't understand if like their goal is to just destabilize Alethi, if it's to further this war. I didn't, the one reveal at the end I really, really didn't like was that the uh, Parshmen are void bringers. I did not like that twist because Why it just, because it just felt so out of nowhere. Like, it didn't feel like there was any way I could have seen that coming. It didn't feel like there was any connection where I should have been. It wasn't like an oh moment. It was like an oh kind of moment. So it was okay. just kind of like out of nowhere. And I don't like when twists don't feel developed. It just felt like he threw it in. And obviously going forward maybe. But I also just the whole I'm trying to think conflict cause... between the Alethi and the Parshendi. There's this like thing that happens in war in real life, in fantasy, whatever, where it's this otherization that happens. Where like, and Kaladin really actually struggles with this the entire book of like uh, the Parshendi. Versus them. Right. Whereas like we're fighting the Parshendi, I have to shut it off. And Dalinar struggles with it a little bit too, but Dalinar is not that pompous anyway. Um, where it's this whole, I can't think of them as people. And it was worse kind of to read because they aren't human right like they are some other species and so like this otherization that happens because you're fighting a people gets worse because in this fantasy world they actually are inhuman and so I was like I wanted to see that be something characters have to struggle with but then to reveal at the end that they aren't just inhuman but they're literally evil beings is See what's interesting. I, I get what you're saying. And um because Yasna, we get, I think it might have been in some of the epigraphs as it talks about well, first of all, there's the one thing we get about a void bringer, and it supposedly it's the one picture that Shalon sends that's the mm -hmm. um the one that's and, like looming, it looks like the yeah. thing from Stranger Things. And even still, like the evidence is it's like, oh, talking about the fact of uh the coloring that is similar to Parsh Parshman and it's the songs specifically because of the Parshendi she talks mm -hmm. about the rhythms mm -hmm. and we learned that the Parshendi seem to be able to communicate with each other right which I saw singing. like the whole them singing in battle I was like yeah this is like how they're giving their orders and things yeah um so I can see the connection the fact is, is saying the Parshendi are void bringers, I see the connection based on it. To jump to also include the Parshmen. And, but I do enjoy the concept of what she says is 
we're human beings. Do we think you do you think we could just destroy something like that? Something we so control powerful. Control it. Yeah. I yeah. love that concept. That no, it's like and that's we definitely had the ability, interesting. If we could take demons and subjugate them and make them docile and use them, oh it's yeah, so realistic. Which is interesting. I just I'm hoping in like the future books they kind of build that connection better because it really did feel like it was out of nowhere. I will not confirm nor deny anything. I know, I know. Um, this this story, get, the books get so much more interesting. Oh, like, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to take a little bit of time to off. Most of our main characters so far. I know. I'm trying to think if there's any because I I mean well and we haven't even talked about Hoyt yet. But oh, I don't. Yes, wit. Uh, the wit, I love him. Okay, so he's. Have you read Farseer? To me, reading wit, he felt like a knockoff fool, but not in a yeah, bad he does. way. After reading Farseer, now the fool is just does. the same kind of character done so much better. So, like, I love the wit. This is not me by any means mocking wit. I think wit is fantastic, but the fool is just that much better that it's like he's kind. He's good. He's great, but he's not perfect you know they're different they're they are different the wit, right? the wit as the wit is <laughs> awesome it. well and i like that like i think the difference between the fool and the wit um is that fool is trying to entertain himself um and like yes he hides meaning in what he says for certain people to discern there's no meaning in the wit the wit is just there making fun of people and he's yeah. intentionally dumbing himself when down he, to their level. When he goes outside of that stuff, he's much more interesting. Like, um, mm, well, the all storytelling we, he does. Oh, God, for, that was such... That's one of those scenes that I can, like, see it, and it's so cinematic. It was really with cool. With the smoke and everything With the like flu, that. and that's one of those scenes that, like, I just want to see it in a movie, please. <laughs> and then the end of the book. See, I didn't... I have no his idea what weird, happened in that. <laughs> well, for I just to start off, his weird like tongue twistery of like, well, what's the most important skill to have? Some people would say it'd be good at art. Some people would say it'd be too good at invention. When it's actually just being the first timeliness, being the first and all that. I disagree stuff. with him so fundamentally on this because it's not just being the first; it's being the first of a class that's privileged enough to be acknowledged for it. But well, but it just happened to go like he knew what was this guy was about to show up. It seemed he was waiting for him. Oh he yeah, says totally. He's waiting for somebody, and so when he finally shows up, he says it's not really being the first. He just uses the general term as timeliness of, mm -hmm. and so you have no, you no questions about or no predictions about this random guy who showed so up. So I. I think I might know who it is just based on like greater Cosmere stuff that I might have maybe been spoiled for this um, because I know I don't know who Hoyt is but I know what Hoyt is if that makes sense um, okay. and to not spoil it for anybody else I won't like explain that and I think I know who this guy is I think I'll say I think it's a character from Warbreaker The guy, I think, don't they say what he is? I don't oh, here, I gotta so. bring up the art. The, the, well, they give him like a title, but I don't know what it is. I I don't want to give you the connection unless it seems obvious from it. Uh, he had named himself a herald. Who am I? I am Telenel. Ellen, Stone Sinew, Herald of the Almighty. The desolation has come. Oh God, it has come, and I have failed. Exactly. He's so a no, herald. I have no idea who he is. Um, I thought he's maybe a, he's a herald, he a certain character, but no. Do I don't know how much did they talk about the heralds? Like, all we get about the heralds is not this. a lot. Not a lot. Um. That I remembered. I don't know. Like I said, that's the kind of thing where it seems like it's just background world building and then suddenly it's very important and I don't know what happened. Um, also, just kind of a time check. We've been doing this for like an hour and a half. Yeah, uh, I know. I don't know if we want to try to split this. Nah, nah. We'll just do one long episode. It's fine. Um, I just not want to find one thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I thought... 
Hoyd as the whip was interesting. I thought Hoyd in that scene with Kaladin was super cool. Uh, and I'm looking forward to more from him. But I just want to see if something mentions a name or not in this. Okay. I know. Well, and okay, I'm going to just talk briefly about the deities and stuff because we have the Almighty, the, you know, what did Storm the guy Father. say his name was at the end? Wait, am I going to have to flip that? Oh, I think I know what you might be hinting at, maybe. Uh, Talonel Ellen. How is that? Okay, Talonel? Like it says that's what his name is? Yeah, give me, I think. Uh, mm, okay. Maybe. Wait, maybe. Oh, yep. There it does. Look. Is page. it in the prelude? Yep. Talonel Collect said his was the only blade unaccounted for. He's the one that had to go back to the desolation. Okay. Wait. As soon as you started looking for it, I made that connection. I was like, wait, is he one of the names from... Because the other name that came up was that one that Dalinar was having in his visions that the Stormfather said was bad. I can't think of what it is. It starts with an O. Odium? Uh, Odium. I looked for him at the beginning and he wasn't there and then I kind of forgot no, about the, it, but yes. That's why I wanted to check names because I didn't want to tell you that without it being clear because I felt like it would be like well, maybe and something you learn more. From the so prelude, the I think what happens, right? The heralds are the ones, it's the circle of 10, right? And what yeah. it seems like in the prologue is that the heralds are like summoned whenever the void bringers are taking over the earth, maybe. And that basically it got to this point and in between those summonings, they have to stay in this horrible place where they're tortured. Kind of like the Heroes of the Horn, but less pleasant. Um, and basically at the beginning in the prelude, the heralds were like, screw it, we're not doing this anymore. We give up. And Talonel was the one that like had already died and was already in the desolation. And so they're like, yeah, screw it. Already in the bad place again. Right. Not the desolation. Yeah, the bad place. They were like, screw it. He can take the punishment for all of us. We're out. And now he's been summoned, which seems to imply that a big thing is coming again. Interesting. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, desolations are, yes, it seems when all the, that we hear all the time, it seems is when the void fingers are starting to take over again. Mm -hmm. Yes, it seems like these heralds are summoned whenever a desolation is happening. Um, I don't know how much it talks about. No, it doesn't really. You get a little bit of a hint from what he says at the end there, where he's like, you guys might have forgotten how to make steel or something like that, doesn't he? Maybe. I don't know. But whatever. He seems to be coming to these people like these people. He's, he's expecting humans to be stupid or something like that when he shows up at the end. No, he just like passes out. Oh. All he does um, is he shows up. Uh, da, 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 da. And somebody said, blah, blah, blah. Who are you? And then he stands up. He's like, go, run, raise the call, give warning. Who am I? I am Talonel Ellen, Stone Sinew, Herald of the Almighty. The desolation has come. Oh, God, it has come, and I have failed. And then he passes out. Oh, sorry. I gave a little spoiler. I mean, Whoops. that's fine. Um, um, but no, um, so it's like these, the heralds show up. So it's... And it's implied from the prelude that it's like they're kind of like a lock or some kind of containment or because they mentioned the oath pact. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, and there's that's some the whole... kind of connection. And, well, and yes, Dalinar it keeps like... having those unite them visions. And he's like, it means unite the princes of Al Alethi. And I was like, that's not what this means. And I think it means unite the like shard bearers or unite the radiance or unite the. Yeah heralds so like i think what's kind of happening is that these characters are being built up as like the next generation of heralds maybe it's kind of what i've been hmm. vibing with is that yeah. like kaladin dalinar adolin shalin yasna are gonna well oh, that's only five though maybe navani yeah. that's weird but like they're being built up as like this is the next generation of radiance or anything and so it'll be interesting we'll see but yeah so it's it, it's that I just wanted to, because that's why I said it's so interesting. So this guy who showed up at the end is, because you implied that all of a sudden, like, wait, uh, Kaladin has these weird powers that nobody's had in thousands of years. Well, but that came from Sill, sort of. 
and well, that's yeah, that so like we, symbiosis yeah. is interesting um so yeah and then finally this herald shows up at the end and he's like i failed which as far as we know the last desolation was considered the last desolation mm-hmm. the final desolation and everything that's been hinted at in dalinar's visions is no the real final one's showing up coming yeah. now yeah no and that's it's just way of kings feels like a very 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 long prologue for an actual book <laughs> kind of <laughs> Which is why, like, I'm excited to move on and get to the rest of the series. I'm going to take, like, a bit of a break. I'm probably going to, like, take a month off between each book just to kind of spread it out. Um, but I'm really excited. And, yeah, I don't know. Did you have any other questions? Any other things you were wondering? No, that was it. Is, is, is I can't wait for you to read more. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'm going to My spread true them out. favorite character hasn't been introduced yet. Oh, really? That's she exciting. She's currently the background on my computer, too. I think is who she's. Yeah. So there's be. another name that I know I have heard, but I can't think of what the name is right now. But I know I've heard another name, but I cannot think of who it um, is. Because since I have eventually getting my leather bound edition of this coming, uh, is I got a digital bunch of digital artwork for free. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's that cool. they sent to me, and I put up it on my background. And I'm assuming it's supposed to be this character that you haven't been introduced to yet. Interesting. I'm glad. Oh my god, I was talking. I was talking with one of my friend about this, and it just like hit me that there's literally four women in this entire book, and one of them isn't even human. I mean, like there's random background women, but like we have Shalin, Navani, Yasna, and Sil. And yeah, there's a few background because there's the scribes and like wives and stuff, but like there's a fifth one hinted at that also isn't human. I think it's there's a chapter named after her too. Well, now I but, know. Uh, no, I just I'm not gonna. There's yes, there's I think, come by the end of the second book, there's only gonna be like six or seven. Well, I, I mean, it's not like there's like main but, male characters. There's Kaladin, yeah. Adel, and Dalinar, but there's also Elokar, Sedeus. There's all of the men on Bridge Crew Four. You know, so it's just it's interesting. Anyway. Yeah. All right, we should finish up. This has been fun. It's really fun to talk mm-hmm. about books. That Yeah, <laughs> take a little break from speculation and talk about things we actually know. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. If you were interested in this, uh, I'm going to be posting, I recorded my thoughts as I was reading Way of Kings. So you can go see my thoughts more in depth and watch my wild journey with this book over on our YouTube channel. Uh, where I'll have book diaries for the Way of Kings coming out all through March. Probably I'll get them all out. So. Yep. Um, and you can find us on wherever you found us right now to listen to this, watch this, whatever you're doing. Um, we're on Twitter. Um, like I said, we're focused mostly on Wheel of Time based stuff, but on our YouTube channel, we do other book related stuff and things. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to mention this now. This is going to go up at the end of February, but for the month of March, Ben and I, as well as a bunch of other Wheel of Time creators, are going to be doing a fundraiser to try to make money for some schools and things. I'll give more information on this for anything we post in March. We'll have more information, but just kind of keep an eye out for that. We'll have a pinned link on Twitter or if you want to donate to help a school get a little money for something. So that's something we'll give more information out when it happens, but because this is coming out at the end of February, I figured I'd put it out there. Yep. Sounds good. All right. And uh, we'll see you the next time the wheel weaves. Wheel turns. We'll see you the next time the wheel turns, whatever our sign off is. Goodbye. (laughs)